What did I say we were going to do? Oh, introducing uh, a new channel. Absolutely. How do we do that? Uh, we might have, well, we might just already have done that. We might, yeah. Technically, might, we have. I might have just said we're introducing a new tra- channel, and then we did it. And then I said how, but I'd missed the moment That's where it. we had our new channel. This is it. Mm. A new oh con- yeah, a new conversation, a new channel, true. a new conversation. This is Absolutely. this is a new conversation, but it's also an old conversation. Not mm. only because we've been talking about it for the last twenty minutes, yeah, but also because this is the second part of the discussion, um, a six-part discussion, but also the second video, the third video. I'm not sure. We're going to release three videos at the same time to launch the channel. Uh, so this is this, like I said, the second part in a six-part discussion. And also, um, so obviously is this, the first part of that discussion, uh, which mm. we recorded two weeks ago with our, with our, our incredibly well-ghosted friend, Stephen Hughes, while he was practicing his hauntology <laughs> last time, he has fully hauntologically um, evaporated. And he is no longer with us. He's not dead, but he's not here. Uh, and the third video is um, a video essay uh, I, I've done. Um, and I will not explain anything in the video because I, th- I think that's the way I'm going to go. But I might as well take this opportunity to do so. Hmm. Um, I accompany the essays by playing civilization so that's something you can all look forward to because we're gonna have an audience now so ye all well in our previous chats that didn't exist we fully anticipated to do so now yep um but it's it's uh the the video essay it's a short 15 minute one and um hopefully all of them will be between 10 and 15 minutes um and not long enough for you to get bored of my Civilization 3 gameplay. Classic. Um, been playing that for 20 years and still really can't get off the easiest level. Um, sorry, the topic is about <laughs> this, <laughs> this chat. Uh, so in this chat, um, we're going to be talking about postmodernism and the universal subject. Um I notice, okay, so the three sources is Mark Fisher's Capitalist Realism, the preface from Hegemony and Social Strategy by Lachlan Mouffe, and a, a video on Zero Books by Doug Lane uh, from sometime in March last year, almost a year old, mm. uh, called Is Postmodernism Conservative? And um, the essay is... Is inspired by that video because it's sort of saying something that maybe Doug Lane isn't focusing on as such. And obviously, because I go like I started off talking about sort of the alt right and only introduced Doug Lane's video into it halfway through, I'd actually kind of struggle uh, to sort of really pin down his um, his meaning. So at the end of it, where I say like his vagueness begs. The question I don't know you might not remember because I assume because I only shared it to you very recently uh, shared mm-hmm. it with you um so like his main thrust of that video is is going one way and all of a sudden at the end he sort of changes tack I think and I'm just like oh I think you know I don't, I don't think he's coming down on any side of the coin there so uh, so sorry the two the two sides are um the first the main thrust is a critique of postmodernism as a conservative um, thing, uh, in line with Mac- Matt McManus's book, which I don't know the name of. Sorry, Matt. Not that I know you. Sorry, Mister McManus. Um, it it's um, that's yeah, that's the that's the he's promoting the book because he's the publisher <coughs> of the book, Doug. 
and not that I know you either, Mr. Lane. Um, and um, he takes in the middle of it. He takes the he takes the sort of um, what 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 I at least while I was watching it was going yeah 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 that's absolutely spot on the uh, Frederick Jameson um, side of things uh, oh. with with regards to uh, our cultural <coughs> stasis and it, and it feeds right into Mark Fisher's capitalist realism. But then, I mean, which is, which is all sort of critical of Habermas's modernism and liberalism and consensus based um, vision for democracy uh-huh. and the left. And, um, but then at the end, he sort of throws in, he throws in the sort of possibilities of Habermas and just goes, well, Hmm. you know maybe he has a point sort of thing but then as he does it like he does a double mid mid-air pivot at the end and then just sort of opens everything up just going oh well maybe all of it's bollocks i think i think that's what he's saying i mean yeah. for anyone who hasn't seen the video nothing well i'll, I'll have said there just w- won't have made any sense but we'll get into the actual video through this chat and you can also just go watch it yourself um but yes, the, the third video that we're going to be publishing at the same time covers that or is inspired by that. Um, not, it's not a response to, but it's, um, it's about it. <laughs> it's taking those ideas and sort of maybe adding just a little, a little step forward, even though, it, even though we as the left have, are discussing these like safe sort of ideas and we really need, like I mean, it, it, it's almost as if the concluding point to any left video is we need to make a strong step forward like Zizek always asks like what I want to know is what will we do the day after revolution yeah and um, yeah I mean that's kind of the same ending to this so so we, we always get to this point and we're just waiting for you know someone to make those brave steps forward and be decisive mm. and actually no we shouldn't really because that's kind of authoritarian. We should really sort of have a an enormous democratic situation that 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 opens up that negotiation um, to allow an, a sort of an organic conclusion to that to that question. But this this video that I did was a little because it's an interpretation of what he was saying. So it's a little mm. a little step forward, not quite the brave step forward. But I suppose this this chat this six part series is an attempt to make um some solid solid steps towards if not if not um providing uh, a suggestion for people to adopt then at least for ourselves and i think i mm-hmm. mentioned the way i put it in the last video was um to help us insert ourselves in a process that is ongoing outside that will um, lead towards a, uh, a hegemonic left populist project. Uh-huh. Um, I mean, there are populist left projects, but perhaps not necessarily hegemonic ones. And you can't, you can't, um, you can't just make a hegemonic one. You can uh, agitate towards a hegemonic project and you can, you can sort of wait for the opportunity and act on it decisively, be mm. a part of it at whatever sort of level because a hegemonic project sort of necessitates a an hierarchy. Um, so it doesn't matter where you are, where you find yourself on it once it begins to assemble. Um, you sort of got to be ready to recognize and have worked toward that point that once it becomes possible it can go forward um so yes inserting ourselves if no one else at least ourselves into some sort of project that will make it make youtube redundant that'd be nice yeah that 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 would be cool i think yeah like on the on the back of that as you said we we discussed it briefly well not, I think maybe towards the end was was where I'm, I'm alluding to um, of the last chat that we had um, specifically, you know, discussing, like you said, uh, the 
these chats being the beginnings of or the at least an attempt to kind of enter into the into the stream so to speak i guess like there is the you know the running attempts that are being made towards some of the topics that we're talking about um progressive strong bounds uh, on the on the side of the left um towards these more sort of i guess you know uh, overcoming some of the ideas that we've talked about previously, where the uh, the kind of I guess the hurdles that the left up to this point has sort of began to struggle more and more with regards to um, how we organize amongst ourselves or the inability to do so. Um, similarly, you know, I guess how we are presenting then in the public as you know uh, as the left you know what are we presenting as the left to the public i guess is a better way to say that um but by having even having these conversations um and it is something we touched on in the last uh the last chat about you know what is um you know is is the fact that we're even having these conversations in any way shape or form uh an act or a step towards you know that this this progressive movement forward that we want to achieve. Um, and I think we kind of came to the conclusion that generally we feel absolutely, you know, if, as you, as we said, entering into a stream where it's already moving forward, um, it's joining in that, in that revo revolution forward. So to, <laughs> to use the word in a, two different ways, um, the word, the word, um, yeah, and and joining in in that movement, that movement forward, and as you said, if not only opening up the, the space that won't be spoken. Sorry, continue. <laughs> At least opening up a space that might encourage other people to join us and start talking to us, uh, meaning we can talk to them. To them. Uh, meaning that there's and there's more people. Exactly, um, encouraging more and more people to try and get involved with what we're attempting here. Um, if only for that if if not if 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 only to sort of be making more sense of some of this stuff ourselves and again pushing if, if only to be less white and male if only to be less white and male um, but also what ali said yes <laughs> it can be both i think it is both <laughs> but yeah um yeah i think that was just it yeah our channel we just introduced it mm. Um, so the actual, the going forward, then this is, there's like three subtopics and I, and I, I go over these twice in the, uh, in the last video, but just to, for continuity, um, <laughs> there's three <laughs> subtopics across the six. Um, the last one was on, uh, capitalist realism and hegemony. Uh, this one's on postmodernism and the universal subject. And the next two are on populism. Um, the next one will be focusing on MOOFs, populism. Uh, mm -hmm. And then the one after Lackler's populism. And then the, f the, neck, the final two are... Uh, it's a little bit less structured. There's not something that slots into each one. And hopefully there's enough to... I mean there's infinite amounts to talk about but hopefully there's enough that we've that we'll have ready uh, to actually span two chats but basically it's um based on identifying so if this is if this is sort of identifying who who gets to partake but not 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 in terms of like in terms of virtue who gets to be who's the real leftist or authentic left like that but and it's not not even in the sense of like who whether it's whether it's identity politics or whether it's class politics but who when we're talking about um, movements who tends to become attracted to them and and why and then how can that be extended because uh -huh. we want everyone because the left should be everyone i mean i know the the 1% the 99% occupy all that failed um but it did leave a legacy it did add to the sort of it sedimented the sort of the contemporary leftist history that's you know took a big a big 
corner um, after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Well, it didn't take any corners then, it seems. Um, but since since the since the dawn of history awoke in two thousand and one, after that fall, where was the end of history? Uh, supposedly, um, things have been happening uh, very slowly, very very gradually. And I suppose in the last last five years, it it feels like um, the potential for a diverse left movement um, is burgeoning. I mean, mm-hmm. well, actually, yeah, let's not go into it. But yeah, so that's 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 the first two, the who. So then, populist, the the pop, the focus on populism um, is a is a is a how. So like the technical the technical sort of things that make up a populist movement. Um, Lacalle looks a lot on history. Um, so maybe we won't focus too hard on that because it's kind of is a little bit boring unless you're total sort of political history buff um and yeah so so the technical how to how a, how a populist movement what constitutes a populist movement rather than who and um what are those uh, sort of technical things that uh, that need to happen to uh, constitute it uh, and then so so the, these final two are the what um so it's like uh, in, and I, I said this last time as well. In, in one of David Harvey's books, he brings up I think a seven point uh, schema that Marx outlined in terms of the transition from transition from feudalism to capitalism that covers um, relations, social relations, environmental relations, material relations, uh, law, legal structure, um, uh, labor and production relations, consumption relations. Excuse me. And um, I, I, yeah, so so he sort of he defined the paradigm uh, along these frontiers. Like, okay, so each and every, I think seven points, seven frontiers, substantially changed in this transition period, and then you've got you you have left behind feudalism, and you are now in capitalism. So, so what I'd like to discuss in those two chats uh, in a couple of months are what. Um, what those frontiers might be now, like say, like take those frontiers that Marx identified and see how relevant they are and how how they fit. Are they adequate? Do we need other ones? Mm-hmm. And um, I think that maybe maybe that makes the first chat, and then the second chat will be like, okay, so here's the ones we've identified, whether same or, or otherwise. And um, what what um, what beautiful visions can we sort of come up with? Um, goals, aims things that we can identify that if achieved we can go oh we've left capitalism behind and now we're in beautiful sunny socialism Mm. and that's the uh that's the plan so now now for this chat Postmodernism and the universal subject. Why is the universal subject important? Why is the universal subject? Are you asking me these questions directly? <laughs> Sorry, I thought these were rhetorical questions. <laughs> it's like, what is the universal subject? Why is postmodernism important? Universal subject, any thoughts? Um, Honestly, I mean, these were definitely two topics when we first started discussing these. These were, were quite quite new to me, actually. Uh, well, postmodernism, I had understood from an, I think, mostly from an art art, art perspective, which I hadn't understood either. Um, but again, looking more, more and more into it, um, obviously coming to terms with, I think, a little bit more along the lines of what, what, what was meant in regards to Lane's video regarding postmodernism. Um, the universal subject in, I guess, well, I suppose in, in Marxist um, philosophy is something I'm still a little shaky on, to be fair. Um, it's not, yeah, I think that's really the best thing. That's right. The, it's mm. the, um, 
I'm trying to think. I'm trying to remember. I think like like uh, once we finished talking about because uh, we we did four earlier chats before this as a mm. prelude for ourselves. Uh, four chats discussing each chapter of hegemony and social strategy, mm. and um, uh, do, do they directly reference the universal subject? I'm not sure. They might, but basically. The, their definition of, definition of it is the attempt of classical Marxism to define a uh, this the revolutionary subject as um, determined by class, uh-huh. and because to situate it today, the one percent and the ninety nine percent is a is a synthesized class cleavage uh, that denotes the disgustingly rich and the literally everybody else. Um, it's close enough to universal. So oh, okay. it's so a subject. It's an attempt to articulate the, oh, well, I guess in that, in that regard, they're articulating the, yeah, the 99% in this case are the universal subject as, or as, as you said, as close to as possible. So yeah, I guess in, yeah, in regards to Marx's philosophy, then it's denoted or articulated through class consciousness, I guess. Yeah, yeah um, absolutely. Hmm. Um, um, the, the issue the issue, I guess, uh, the tension, why this is an interesting conversation uh, to have is that, um, so in Doug Lane's video, again, I, I don't think he directly says we need a universal subject, but while I was watching it almost a year ago, um, it, it really resonated with me in terms of, oh, no, no, this is, this is, a, this is a statement, like in terms of, yes, we can create a universal subject, we just... We don't, it doesn't need to be a classical Marxist one. It doesn't need to be authoritarian in terms of um, what you have to be to be part of it. Because obviously, remember the uh, the 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 isolationism of of the proletariat that was like the sort of demanded of the working class. Mm-hmm. If you want to be part of this movement, you've got to be tick all these boxes. Sure. Um, so. Lack like move counter that with listen you can't you can't um you can't just predetermine what the revolutionary subject is um the revolutionary subject um will arrive through like Gramsci's organic crisis um there's no telling what um what sort of gives way that induces a section of the public that that um that bursts forward and becomes hegemonic in in a in an an anti um an anti status quo movement uh, mm. or what the revolutionary subject um the other the other aspect of it is it, it's just authoritarian as soon as you declare that this is the type of thing that needs to happen, that needs to occur in terms of identity and belonging and community, and particularly because it is universal, that there's enough of them that it encompasses, so, like, if you, the revolutionary subject has to be a global subject, it has to be enormous. Uh, as, as soon as you expect that this is the thing that um, must occur, and if you mm. attempt to agitate it towards it, and if you become successful in doing so, then you're suppressing an awful lot of um, grievances, an awful lot of um, issues that will arise naturally between people. Um, as soon as you put a community in a, in a pot with a lid, it, it'll begin to boil and spit and fight, <laughs> and uh, and uh, it'll want something. It'll want something different. It'll start fighting mm. with itself. Um, so, um, so in reading their take on it, uh, you're like, oh God, well, we got to chuck that idea. But since you've got the likes of Doug Lane and Slavoj Zizek, um, go, no, 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 hang on, you know, let's, let's consider the possibility of the universal subject. Uh. So I think, um. So that tension within what exists on the left in leftist discourse today is an interesting one to pick 
nitpick part. And um, and my hunch is that the two positions aren't entirely divorced from each other. Um, I think I think where people tend to be at today, um, plurality is is something that um, that they value. That even if they didn't value, I don't believe many on the left. I mean, you'd 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 probably just end up being on the far right if you didn't value plurality um, mm. today. Um, apologies if anyone out there uh, happens to happens to, um, to to have to have to take some flack off some Egypt who says they're on the left and they're not into plurality. Not a not not of my community. <laughs> um, the yeah yeah. So I don't I don't think I don't think the position it's it, it's probably not quite semantic, but it's probably in the phrasing where the actual difference is, and not necessarily in the substance. Uh-huh. Um, I'm, and I guess well, I mean I guess with regards to um, Muff. Um, specifically regarding uh, her views on, you know, taking into account the, uh, uh, as you mentioned, this this plurality of, um, of, uh, I guess I, you know, burgoing identities, um, you know, new, um, I can't remember the exact term that she uses for this. Um, yeah, it's new subject positions, um, sort of in, well, in, in society in general, but also existing, uh, we can actually also say isolated over on the left as well. Um, I'm wondering, I guess my first, I guess my first point is more of a, a, a supposition of can, um, can her sort of very plural, diverse um, framework for radical democracy um, contain within it um, a like can that can, can that sort of essentially outline I guess this year uni- a universal subject while also encompassing the vast plurality within uh, so the you know I, but I I'm also wondering now after saying that I guess that's that's kind of the question is how yeah how will how can the universal so how do we articulate the universal subject in such a way that it can maintain and 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 allow for this plurality of various and numerous subject positions um so as not to i guess push against their the the autonomy and individuality that we want for these this plurality for the plurality and everybody in society but at the same time finding a connective um i suppose tissue that's general enough that allows for it to all be articulated under a universal subject. Um, I think that's the nuts and bolts of um, hegemony social strategy, as well as her um, books leading up to agonism. And then the, uh, their two books uh, on populism really sort of are at pains to, to describe how that's possible. Um, before we get into it, I think let's return to postmodernism um, and actually start with that, and then head on to universal, the universal uh-huh. subject in a in a sort of a deeper, a deeper way. Uh, I think uh, unless you've got something to say, because you had started to say something about capital, um, not capitalist realism, postmodernism. So if there's something else you wanted uh-huh. to add to that, or. I th- Sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I think with regards to, uh, like I said, I was still quite new to the concept of, I guess, the way we were um, analyzing these subjects through, I guess, post-modernity um, was something that was quite new to me. This use of the term, I guess, um, just even on a historical perspective, I mean, I could point to points, historical sort of uh key key points of modernity and postmodernity, but again without going too deep into it it was something It'd be difficult I to do that to be fair i mean for and again it's, 
Well, no, that's the thing. I mean, it's, 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 it's now based on a lot on, you know, having to sit there and go, okay, there's definitely 10 pages in this book. I don't understand. Go and go and find something somewhere else and then go, oh, okay, cool. I can. Oh yeah. Okay. okay. Sorry. So, um, but yeah, I guess the focus on post-modernity specific, I, and this is my, my take on, on where Lane is coming from. And I guess where subsequently the book that he's, he's, he's pushing, um, is is talking about it is the i guess the um i don't want to call it an exit but i guess the the progression on from modernity which i think and i think even fisher actually kind of points to this in capitalist realism uh he uses fordism as as yeah. as the kind of like a like a kind of key point or a historical landmark to be able to point towards like i guess a touchstone for what he kind of considers at least within with regards to capitalism i suppose it's it's um, similar it's similar to the uh what i was saying about harvey and marx for the last two chats that there's all these frontiers so that, so that it's not so organized but um there's there's different strands in society that um over the last hundred years change in a substantial way and like postmodernism in in the in academics isn't doesn't allude to one thing in fact a lot of people would dispute the term outright but um and that so what you were talking about there was post-industrialism and there's um post-modernism obviously i'm not sure if the term came about through through the art movement you know but i mean that, that that's a possible like that may be the case but just take take it for the fact that that's a possibility you know so and then from that from that um field sort of spilled over into encompassing things like post-industrialism and then uh, looking at um different ways of cultural consumption and then then you know so so the term just sort of hegemonized um an awful lot of um aspects of our society in in the post-war period in particular uh-huh. sorry um, if no you... and i guess the the only other kind of i think very reductionist take that i think this might have even come up in a previous conversation just offline between the two of us was um you know this kind of moving away from modernism where once upon a time you know uh sort of i guess i guess the the notion of making like a sort of you know grand sweeping statements was sort of slowly giving way to post-modernity where it became grand, very granulated with regards to. I mean, I suppose with regards to politics, anyway. Maybe that, that maybe that's a, a, a fair. No, that that might be one of the key factors for what we're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this Steven idea that brought it that became, up last week or last time. Yeah, hyper, you know, hyper detached. I guess very individualized, very granular. Um, which you know, again, you hear actually very, very ironically starts getting brought up to. Um, as a description of the left nowadays, which yeah. I find very interesting that, you know, you hear the term post-modern neo-Marxist, um, where, so, I mean, I think that, has, you know, and just, I mean, I, I think that that's, you know, a, a separate, a separate video in and of itself to try and to talk to, through that. No, I, th- I think, uh, I think that's actually fully on point, to be honest. I think there's a lot of purchase mm-hmm. in, um, at the moment or since, since the, say the fall of the, Berlin Wall um, for this idea that uh, not necessarily the right as such, but the the centrists, um, the status quo, um, get to articulate the 20th century as this wasteful um, period where, and, and because they are sort of, they're first in line with this, they, they position the left as this, um, this barking historic troop that wasted an entire century tail spinning society into this fight between between um state and market mm-hmm. and um and now because we're out of it it's wonderful and we're free and we don't need to do this shit it doesn't have to be left and right anymore let's spin that childish naive pedantic fucking waste of time and resources and the millions of people that died and and the millions of people that that went through the the poverty in in russia and cuba just based on ego and principle of these couple of men who just couldn't like let it go and 
and now we're free and uh, and we don't need grand narratives anymore that it, w- it was the century of grand narratives fighting um fighting you you somehow the grand narrative like descending upon the planet and humanity and like scooping it up and pushing it into this conflict and and now we're free from that and let's just consume so it is on yeah. people it's it's yeah. it's absolutely on point the um what you're saying okay um but yeah i mean i think my my very limited understanding of of i guess the context of what we're talking about with regards to postmodernism i think that that sort of yeah that sort of encompasses kind of my i guess what i took away from the various sources that we've looked at um and they are very reduction reductionist claims i guess uh with regards to i mean reducing it down to the idea that yeah like we have modernity on this one hand which was yeah a yeah a, a big overarching the time of 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 big uh sprawling ideas under one grand narrative moving into this idea of postmodernism like we said is more granulated more i guess hyper individualized um and i mean yeah, yeah I sorry think I, was, I think i was i was touching on the other side of there wasn't i but absolutely um there's also the ridiculous idea that um yeah as you said the uh, the postmodernism is is some sort of um conspiracy by leftist intellectuals and academics to mm, to mm. what i'm not sure oh yeah, yeah to break to break down traditional social bonds like yeah. the idea that um the idea that a man can be a woman and or a man can love a man or a man can pee in a woman's toilet and mm. this ridiculous um conversation um it, it mm. is a conspiracy to just like to just to, to what like to, to break yeah. to, i don't even know what to, to, <laughs> what does it take away from society <laughs> I mean, I guess that's the thing, like another, another sort of conspiracy hot take that I've heard was, you know, the, the, it's these ideas of, and you hear it actually, I think it, it becomes, um, uh, was it like Western, uh, you know, Western norm, normative values, things like the nuclear family. Um, again, like you, you put, like you put it, um, not the, the idea of relationships of, uh, same sex relationships, for example, um, this this you know th- this is this this very uh ir- you know corrosive postmodernism that's being brought in by the academics on the side of the left um it's being brought in to try and tear down these ideals that we've built up things like the i guess current understanding of uh democracy um as held by I guess more maybe right right leaning Democrats, um, nuclear family, the two and a half children, um, white picket fenced house, um, Christian Christian values, Christian values yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I the, guess yeah, this the, the postmodernism is there. Is it's it's all us beatniks coming in with our reefer and our gayness, and we're just <laughs> and we're just gonna try and just wreck all that we're just because gonna, we're just gonna yolo throw gayness into your face, and you're gonna catch exactly. it. Exactly, like that's it. It's just you know we come in with our memes, and uh, well, no, they love memes. Actually, they love memes. We're we're, we're apparently yeah. shit at memes. Uh, not my yeah. community. Um, the the right mm. postmodernism is a term that you can employ to describe the social dissolution of traditional values and to appoint the something that questions the symbolic order that um that define communities um you know when you when you when you reterm something when you repurpose a term for in terms of your perspective rather than the community's perspective you're you are shaking the um that symbolic order that holds that community together nothing wrong with that as such um what they're wrong about is this absurd idea that it's an invention not an observation Mm. Mm. and uh and particularly an invention to, to to do that by these specific uh people um the you know so the flip side is where in capitalist realism 
uh, Fisher points out that, uh, I mean, in reduction, in reductionist way of putting it, uh, Thatcher fought for the institution of postmodernism. Mm. So on the right, it happened as well. Except, of course, it's not. It's not. You, you take the lid off that tin and you look inside and you've got no okay so what thatcher did was um was institute policies that um and this is what stephen really uh, brought to the conversation two weeks ago uh policies that began um well a policy agenda uh, over decades that uh, instituted a, a cultural intervention excuse me that um a cultural intervention that, to put it really simply, separated people. So those, that symbolic order, the community, the person that just doesn't feel they fit in the community. So that's, you know, that's a really, you know, that's something I'm sure we both can get behind. It's like, well, listen, you don't have to abide by these rules. You can get out and do it on your own and, you know, feel feel comfortable, find a place shape a place um mm. where where you get to be who you want to be but at the same time um at the same time on um, this cultural intervention on the right not the invention of postmodernism to to destroy the possibility of 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 uh, of a left community working together against that right that status quo but determined policies and technologies infrastructures and resources um, focused to to feed people their individuality in order that they don't really want or need other people and while while the the right like rooted in their philosophy is the idea that the individual doesn't need community or society or other people um there's almost a false extension and aesthetic extension in these policies in this cultural intervention so like if you imagine like a Jane Eyre Jane Eyre or a, or a Dickens book where um where there's the capitalist and 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 the 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 workers the the workers are so poor and impoverished they need each other they are they are by default a collective, whereas individualism, where they where the expression and the free flight of this philosophy is enacted through capitalism and through gaining wealth and and spending that wealth. And it's like ah, oh, I'm 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 I'm, you know, like the the faster the faster the economy is going, the faster I'm I'm sort of my my wealth is accumulating. The more free from everything else I am, the more independent I am. I can pay for pay for medical care i can pay for carriage i can pay for defense i can pay all these things i don't need all of you I'm, 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 i don't have to succumb to a democratic conversation i don't need to sit with you and discuss what fucking has to happen i get to do what the fuck i want because i got the dala and um that today then is extended um in a really weird way through say like social media uh you give people facebook and you give people twitter and um because they're because society is intermediated by a screen a digital interface there's a sense that you don't need any of them anyone else Mm. you you sort of like if you're able to sort of particularly whatever precarious work you've got, you do it and you drudge it. It's a drudgery and, and, and you come back and you just don't want to think about it. And for release, you go on this stuff and you order pizza and you just let your angst out and you fucking give out shit to everyone. And what the thing that you're reacting against, like what, what's generating that angst ap- apart from the fucking drudgery um, of what Stephen said was the instrumentalization of our life um, is also... A, like a reactionary impulse it's like oh my god look at this look at this community i think i can see they're pathetic i fucking hate them blah 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 blah, blah. troll 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 yeah. so it's not it's not even independence it's not individualism 
it's just a, a sort of a simulacra of it. And um, and it is it has hammered uh, our ability to form perhaps not a universal subject, but collective subjectivities at all. And that is the relationship between postmodernism and uh, the universal subject. Leaving the question that we began with, um, well, actually leaving two questions. <laughs> so I suppose before we get to revisit that first question, unless you've got anything to add there. Um, no, I don't think so. Or the big question that Stephen um, brought up, which would be pretty handy if he was here to bring up again, was that um, was that okay? So what's the 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 second question is um, if um, if if this is what's sort of impeding the possibility of collective subjectivities. Um, and in all of Lane, Fisher, and Lacklau Mouffe, all we need to do is recognize this situation, then we can work beyond it. Uh-huh. And that'll certainly, that'll certainly come up once we revisit that question. The, the outstanding issue is how, and that's Stephen's situation. Like He brought up the um, Facebook and everything, big data, how, the, how do uh-huh. we... How do we overcome it? Is it enough? I suppose our take on it last week was that it was enough as a first step to promote the realization of capitalist realism or as an ideology uh, mm. of the existence of um, th- this cultural intervention uh, in order to not not the traditional class consciousness process, but in order to uh, sort of raise um raise a consciousness about society today that we're all we're all in it's not like um like what traditional class consciousness is 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 quite patronizing isn't it? it's like the idea like i oh, know i've got this idea you need to you need to um realize it yeah i mean <laughs> i suppose what we're saying isn't necessarily a million miles away from that but what we're proffering is well this is just a possibility um, we once went outside and hung out with each other, and very quickly, uh, technology was introduced, and um, we've been acting incredibly different. And now we can't even hang out with each other anymore. Um, I think actually on, on the on the uh, I think on the back actually of what you were saying earlier on about this the. Um, uh, the i can't remember your exact words but it was uh regarding social media and the sort of simulacra uh that it, it, it forms uh with regards to a ver- in with regards i suppose to various um aspects of i guess what we now kind of have as human interaction or just life i guess um and yeah i think that actually um one of my uh, now, be it, it, it could be a hot take uh, uh, with regards to um, to social media. Get your hot um, takes. It is a hot take. Well, no, it's not a particularly hot take. I, I don't think so. Uh, I think the one thing that has become progressively clear for me um, is, uh, and and I'll, and I absolutely understand we are we are currently discuss, you know talking via the internet uh in a call so the the irony of what i'm about to say is not lost at least uh, we're together even, even on me but that's the thing um i think perhaps uh in one element the you know the uh, we've we've discussed this before in the past the the left kind of uh leaving the the leaving the occupy wall street um blockades and and going back to the coffee shops um i you know i do believe that in uh, for for to a large extent that's absolutely true um and i think a lot of people took up a barricade online where i think perhaps once upon a time we felt that these the same kind of community could be forged in fact i think maybe we saw a grander uh possibility 
with regards to, wow, and we can reach so many more people now because we have this democratized way of communicating and we democratized. So, you know, and this also this idea of the democratization of the information that's available to us now. Now we have so much more. So not only do we not have to rely on each other to organize, to actually learn new things, um, we also don't have to actually organize together at all, really, because we can do it online. And I think that that, you know, with all the best will and intention of the world, I think it actually ended up hindering. And I don't want to say that the human element of of why or people organizing as a group is so powerful, um, but perhaps it's just taken away. It, it it didn't actually create the collective energy that it meant to, um, or that maybe people went into it thinking it would. Perhaps it created the opposite, actually, just a more hyper individual. But we're all we're all individual together on the same forum or same message board. Yeah. Pe- kind like, of effect all, all, all people who need company don't tend to be online you know who no, are you help they go to the they go to the park <laughs> uh, well whatever. i mean they might not be able to my point like you know like people vulnerable people aren't sitting on the internet bitch and moaning sure sorry I no no, no. Yeah, yeah yeah i'm i'm saying yeah. that i'm agreeing with you um i wonder though because i missed i missed out on that whole period um i felt i felt Occupy was 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 a really sort of mainstream, and when I say mainstream, I mean like I mean obviously a mainstream revolutionary movement would be fantastic. But uh, mm. what I mean was is um, like a sort of a liberal take on on sort of the sort of activ- activism that we were involved in in the in the noughties. Uh, but hang, I think, hang on, go on. Sorry, what, go no, no, no. Sorry, sorry. I I thought that was a qu- the, the that point. Was the, the point I was getting at was that. Um, I got the I got the impression that this this transfer from the fallout of Occupy to the, this online culture war or what it became whatever wherever they went and however that developed like I said I missed out on it but my impression was that um after after such um you'd have burnout you'd have Occupy burnout so if you if you're looking at it in a historic way um you've got burnout for thousands of people they need to reduce, chill out at their desk. And at some point when something similar starts simmering, they might get involved again. And, um, you know, I mean, nothing's, nothing's a clean line in terms of progress. Everything's always up and down. But if yeah. what we were saying last time, if what we're, we're correct about that there is, that there is an increasing interest in these things, um then of course it's going to be constituted by many strands of society mm-hmm. and so, so what might have been like a, an accelerated strand uh, acceler- acceleratedly active strand at one stage once that burnout kicks in they take a dip where other strands if there is an increase at all other strands will take up the slack and eventually recharge the batteries that original group uh, get involved again um mm-hmm. so you know I w- i'm just saying that you know it's it's not it's not to sort of bash anyone or to to sort of see see that moment as as a defeat just um you know there's still quite a quite a lot of potential that can come out of that oh no absolutely sorry and uh, yeah i wouldn't want to um i wouldn't want to 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 appear as if to paint the whole thing as a as a failed moment um i think it's just something that i think it's more my point is an observation of the tendencies of what's hap- of online culture i guess where we kind of went with it because and this is speaking from from someone's from the perspective of somebody that would have spent time on message boards um an awful lot of activity was was witnessed uh in in things like message boards and the you know mid mid to mid 2000s towards you know 2010 i would have seen a lot of it um however uh there would always and and there would always be an element of of you know fury and passion there which i think was what was expressed in getting you know um what's the term um expressed the way you said it but like a like circumvented away from where it might impact the 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 source of that grievance 
Yeah, I guess it's never really allowed to be born past um, the, at the, the level of the screen. And uh, I think, you know, that definitely was... Um, I think I think I, I'm just I, I think it definitely was was impartial. Uh, one of the many outcomes of perhaps um, the burnout that you're talking about, you know, people having to go into a sort of moment of, well, you know, like I still want to be able to be directly involved with these communities, and oh, hey, look, it actually it still exists, but in the digital space which we're starting to occupy now, um, at a much more progressive rate as well. Almost every every day it feels like there's more more and more and more places to go and find people similar minded people to talk to there's Um, us yeah um and go on yeah so no so i think that's that was it was just a it was just a take uh that i had from that because and and you know again i guess it's it's not merely a hot take is it because i this it is literally um a, a, a huge chunk of Stephen's argument, um, and Lane in the video, I think, um, I have a road, I, I attributed to him in my notes, but I, it may not have been because uh, I can't remember him saying it when I watched the video last. But uh, uh, he goes, you know, we are left with a social with the social incapacity to self-organize to form genuine social networks of resistance or collect, collective subjectivities. So it's 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 certainly. It's certainly the issue. Um, it, yeah, the, 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 more, the more pertinent question, I guess. Um, so like I said, like while, while we can get back to that other question, which uh, eludes me right now, the, uh, the, 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 main, the main thing that we, like, we certainly need to sort of give a consideration right now is, is to sort of answer Stephen's question, like how, what, what needs to happen um, and at what level, and is that level achievable uh, in terms of in terms of sort of having an impact at all? And um, so, I think what like, two weeks ago, my my answer was that um, you know, yeah, the two of us agreed that more people are more people are getting interested uh, in talking about the disc, the like the discourse is amplifying perhaps gradually um i mean it's it's in the news a lot um climate change climate change activists um labor sanders like regardless mm. of the them being electoral campaigns and failed or otherwise um the people involved in those campaigns is, is what we're talking about that that's one element um what else um the fact that politics is reemerging uh, as a category in our society is huge and significant mm-hmm. that the hegemony of the previous order neoliberalism is peeling back and while the far right were organized to sort of insert themselves into like the forefront of both peeling back even further the the blanket, <laughs> the hegemony, the fringes of the hegemony, um, but also occupying the space left in that peeling back, um, it's happening. And um, I mean, in... Um, in the preface to hegemony and socialist strategy, um, Lachlan and Mouf, um what what way did they put it? Um, it was a politics without frontiers. That's what neoliberalism was, um, which is a apolitical. A it's an apolitical situation. Um, the message was: as soon as Clinton and Blair um, uh, announced their policy suites as not left, <laughs> not of the left wing. Um, they announced to the world that, you know, that that's over. Uh, politics is over. Um, we've reached a consensus on a way forward. Um, the Cold War is over. Communism is over. Capitalism won. All we're going to do now is find um, consensus on the issues and 
experts then will take over from there. We don't need to discuss it and everything should be fine. And um, a politics way of frontiers and it's no politics at all. And the game, the games people play in history tend to be violent. Um, so I think, I think like, you know, the enlightenment was a response to the hundred years war and the medieval religious upheaval in Europe. Um, money, you know, um, let's, let's play monopoly instead of soldiers. Uh, and, and then of course politics is, is also the, I mean, sort of our, our politics is, is, is due to sort of, a. it's, it's, it's more of a, a game for the elite back in the day that's been extended but of course the left the socialist intervention at some stage in history at some stage at different stages in history uh, until it accumulated to become what it is today or up to 100 years ago um it added an extra dimension and really really made politics a thing and and lacklow moves whole take is that Politics as a game provides us frontiers that um, where we can express that violence. And as long as everyone's playing the, by the rules of politics, then no one needs to destroy the other. And if you take that away from people, and also... So you, you, you took it away. It was taken away from people in the 90s and the noughties. But then people's money was taken away from them as well in the crash. Uh. What the... F- where, where do you think aggression is going to come? You know? And uh. that's why... Well, hence, hence Trump. Hence Brexit. And like we said last time, that's not to say Brexit's a right-wing thing, but we identified it's uh, driven. It was driven by the right and driven by like a xenophobic platform um, and, yeah. and, and a, need to, uh, a need for the sanctity of, of the British way or people or sovereignty or whatever nonsense. Um, so, you know, that's... The mis- I don't know, did I say this last time, but the mistake people are making is to think that Corbyn and Sanders and Trump and Farage are the disruptors. They weren't the disruptors. I mean, of course, Thatcher and Reagan were disruptors. They, they uproot up, like that was an upheaval. But mm. the real disruptors that, that, that are at the root of what's happening today is, is Blair and Clinton. You know, has their Obama. Absolutely, Obama. Like, as soon as Trump came along, I think there was a, an article written by Obama, I can't remember where it was published. And it was just, it was just gross. Oh, yeah, yeah, he said, uh, it was before Trump was elected, and he said, um, it was in, it was, he was addressing the media in America, and it was just like, guys, you better, you better really pull your head out of your ass and stop treating this guy like a joke, because we're under a serious threat here. I was like, you fucking asshole. This is, doesn't matter whether you like it or not this is people enacting their democratic political expression and yeah of course it might lead to fucking to real violent aggression it, it you know it gives it gives um it gives credence to to hate and to 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 white, white supremacy and charlottesville and attacks on synagogues and you know all this disgusting shit that we've seen increasing over the last year or two, um, but that's fucking your fault for saying we got to suppress this. That you being Obama, you know, give mm. give people a foot like Obama. If you gave people an alternative, a decent left option, like Sanders is, Trump might not have happened. Mm. Because that part of American society would have would have felt it was listened to. <laughs> you yeah know? no no yeah no i know what you mean and yeah i, I agree because i mean i guess we yeah we haven't had a real what i guess has felt or or at least you know presented as a, a really existing leftist left um 
party. Left, left, the left. Uh, yeah, like but that was it. We we've we've had these kind of stand-in parties that have kind of played the part, so to speak, but only on a very superficial or very surface level. Uh, they haven't actually risen to meet, I guess, the kind of issues that again, like Corbyn and Sanders, are rising to meet and using terminology that lets that is, I feel, um, uh, emergent is is intense uh because i've heard a lot of people say like things like oh you know it's it's all about the oppressor and the oppressed and you know that's why you can't trust these socialist types and um and i think that the kind of language that's being used by people like i Corbyn don't get that by Sanders. neither do i um <laughs> <laughs> i think it's honest i think it's really honest to like honest language um no no what i mean what i mean is i don't get why that's a that's a worry this the, the the focus on the language of a class and oppressor. Oh, I think I think it probably it harks back always to, the old way down. I think it probably just harks. Uh, it's probably harking on the idea of like, um, again, people I think are expected or are, are expectant of their parties to to run the middle way or as you said, find the consensus. So why do we need this this kind of language anymore? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. You know, it's like we're we're done with this. You yeah. know, we we left all this stuff behind. We're supposed to be voting with our dollar. The debates, um, the debates for um, running up to the UK general election uh, on the TV. Fuck man, the, you know the there was just there was a couple of them, and just these like these appeals. Like, can can you all just get along? Like, can you all just get along? There's Corbyn yeah. and there's Johnson and there's this kid. Can you all just get along? What? <laughs> no, we can't. Yeah. <laughs> In what mm. capacity would you like us? Should we just get Blair back? <laughs> yeah. Will we go to Iraq. We blow it up. Is that what you want? But, and that's the thing. I think. I think Nobody a lot of. It? No, Sorry. but I think. I mean, that is that. You know, it's. It's. I guess it's part and parcel of what we're talking about. I mean, you know, this idea of yeah, like it. The, you know. Blair and Clinton came along and essentially said, look, that's it. We're done. You know, that's it. We're scrapping, scrapping the whole politics thing. Like now we will run this, run the show by, by money. And I think it, it ultimately, and it ultimately, but it did detract greatly from the fact that people stopped making connections between things like their foreign and war. The I mean, this is capitalist realism. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Like we stopped, we stopped going, Oh, the fact that that's happening in that country uh, you know, directly because of the involvement of this country, um, we stopped as, we stopped associating that with any of the the policy from this party. We and stopped mil- seeing it as politics. A million people showed up in London on the on the on the, um, the dawn of the Iraq War. A hundred thousand was it in Dublin? No That's political crazy. party was able to mm. pick up on that. A fucking million people in the streets in London. Mm. One million. People, hello, like, am I? Sh- that that's enough of a base, is that not? I have no idea what the size of a base of a party is, but that's fucking that's a lot of people, like, on yeah, one issue. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, mad. No, no opposition, no alternative. No, and yeah, like you said, no question. But the point here is that that was the politics without frontiers, and we are now seeing politics with frontiers i mean Mm. corbyn sort of failed to really hammer home the frontiers he had identified uh but everyone else everyone else left or right there's frontiers popping up all over the place antagonism Mm. hopefully hopefully somehow we'll get rid of the far right of these frontiers and we will be left with an agonism oh. but we'll continue that discussion in the next chat um but this is significant uh, to bring it back to steven's question um this is significant to me um because i feel that like like not only is there what we're sensing a trend towards an increased and amplified discourse and an increased interest in that discourse. Um, But there are also sort of cultural configurations where 
uh, I think I was bringing up the idea that there is a, a decoupling uh, with the with the increased level of inequality, uh, much like up to 100 years ago, the elite, society's elite, are, are less concerned with the culture of the working class, whereas, of course, for the last um, 100 years or so, or 100 years or less, um, that culture has been, you know, well, the cultural intervention that we've been talking about, uh, it's been it's been a tool, it's been paid intense um attention by the elite mm. it was a, it was a desperate um it was a cultural war uh thatcher thatcher saw that the only way she could get um to to, to reassert the the traditional hierarchical um arrangement in society um she knew that it a cultural shift had to take place um for neoliberalism to to be subsequent to follow social democracy, whereas the the comments of social democracy is like uh, I think we said last time, um, social solidarity uh, somehow, well through through cultural a cultural program, um, people came to become really suspicious of people on welfare and you know the whole. Um, pov porn thing that came out of a culture in britain that hated um poor people all of a sudden and hated um the trappings of poverty i mean i mean like i'm sure I, i'm pretty sure i remember like orwell talking about like how class was defined in britain back then a hundred years ago or whatever like smell was a huge thing like you could smell class off people like, in terms of like if they're poor they smell in a particular way and if you're middle class they smell is particularly disgusting to you and all this sort of thing um mm. but but it rose its ugly head again um once this neoliberal culture program takes effect and uh and solidarity went out the window and um this class division that benefited absolutely nobody except for those receiving surplus value uh in the upper distribution of of wealth um point where i was going there um was that culture was paid an awful lot of attention a, a general popular culture um pop culture which sort of arose around the 60s um convenient so uh, my point is this that because it's not as relevant as not as pertinent pertinent's the word um the elite just won't pay so much attention to it anymore there's a substantial decoupling happening and we will be left to our own devices a lot more and like so so the, the, like the the cultural sphere if it's not if it's not fed keeps of cash it will just like a city it'll sort of crumble a bit and become a bit decrepit it'll turn into a ghetto and you know in in ghettos you get um idiosyncratic cultures developing because there's no longer the the sort of uniform feedback between the periphery and the center does that make sense uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, so so um so idiosyncratic sort of cultures can sort of begin to develop among the rubble and that will leave us so if if the reason that um what was the term you know the crystal uh, no no the uh, the social incapacity to self organize is at the hands of this cultural program of neoliberalism um if that is no longer the case then what then what so i suppose ultimately before we answer that question which is returning to the very first question uh, my answer to stevens is i i'm not sure that um yeah okay so like also brought up last time um facebook is less will be less of a cultural tool the more it becomes a security tool and these cultural things that now separate us while of course they can continue to do that the main thrust of funding might not be in that um strand of of the entity um so it it might become decrepit 
-hmm. where the funding is going is into suppression for when that main thrust becomes decrepit and people begin to um, fucking use it in a different way than they're using it now, which might quite possibly be a more networked and a more sort of, well, efficiently networked um, and collectivizing way. This is the idiosyncratic developments that might might happen in, in a ghetto. Um, that suppression, that's where the money is. That suppression's there to, uh, well, suppress those developments. So say if it was without a digital field, if it was um, money was being pumped into, the, into a city, um, everyone was happy, um, but because of capitalism, the rich got richer, uh, they got so rich that they stopped funding uh, the general public, the trickle-down effect dried up uh, what, what little there was to keep people happy. Um, the, the poor, the working class part of towns um, got poor, um, began crumbling, weren't, weren't maintained. Um, people there be, be stopped reading papers, stopped going to the newspaper, they couldn't bloody afford it, uh, the cinema to anything. Uh, started coming up with their own, their own music, their own way of speaking, their own way of dressing, their own identities, and started realizing the, the disparity the cultural disparity became more apparent in the city and they start rising up. But because the money stopped going into them, into the trickle-down effect, the money went into security. The elite happened to sort of securitize or militarize, which has been happening in the last 20 years, uh, in actual fact, um, militarize police forces and, um, and are ready for that eventual situation where the ghetto rises. The police force... That was a civil situation, became a military situation uh, for um, for such an uprising. So I mean, so it's interesting that Facebook. I mean, obviously, what I just said is is a hypothetical, is a model, but um, it's interesting that Facebook is now mostly in the news for things regarding security, national security. So yeah, I think uh, to me things are, are changing and things are opening up. There's a politics of frontiers or a politics of frontiers um, is re-emerging. Um, and yeah, that, I suppose that would be my answer to, to Stephen's question. Do you have anything to add to that? I just um, yeah. I'm th- sorry. No, 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 not at all. No, I think, I think if anything, uh, I, I think it's all I could do would be point fingers perhaps to highlight instances where i agree with you um uh if anything it's i mean it's something that i've noticed for example i mean you're seeing the progressive rise again of um organized workers unions and industries perhaps where it had never really had workers pres- uh, organized presences before um especially within the digital the digital realm you're seeing a lot of Good luck yeah but you're seeing like a lot of these these kind of um you know a lot of new media companies starting to actually see the benefits of organizing um union at at a, at a union level um again in industries perhaps where workers and the people working within it had had kind of decided or it, it was kind of the the given consensus well we don't really need this because we're having such you know it's it's such we're in a the new wave of new media entertainment we have a better working condition to say that of our parents or of our grandparents so you know we're having a load of fun why would we need to consider having a workers union um so seeing the emergence of workers unions in in industries like new media um television, video games, uh, even amongst people, uh, content creators online, for example, um, starting to take into account their own, uh, things like the, uh, how they're affected, how their, their ability to produce and, um, own, I guess, or produce own and also make money through their work is being impeded on by the larger, uh, larger bodies they're seeing the importance of organizing together in that so i i guess what i would say on just on top of that is yeah i mean it's not much to add it's more just a uh a, a pointing of fingers to say yeah that look that that's also 
what he's talking about. <laughs> um, but I think that's one. I think that's one of the major points that I think is actually a, been a huge, a huge push forward just for me to see at least um, is seeing the yeah the reemergence of things like workers unions in in industries where perhaps it. But due to the kind of the the push to neoliberalism, we may have actually never, uh, may never have been yeah thought to have been needed before because because yeah. you were know, we were too busy supposedly just trying to get rich. You were born of it, it. Mm. and so seeing that starting to come around again is 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 quite positive. I feel, um, and I mean, I think that I think that is like in and of itself. That's a huge, huge shift. Yeah, you definitely. know. Um, you know, I mean, uh, you know, there's, yeah, no, I, th- I think, yeah, in, 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 even in of itself. So, I mean, coupling that with the fact that it's something that is also starting to be talked about by, yeah, as I said, like on an industry in, in a sort of within an organized kind of work space, like that of an industry where people are hired in as workers to work within, say, a company or within an agency. And then also, for freelance producers, freelance, um, you know, even here on the level, you have various factions of workers unions that exist for teachers, for musicians, for, um, you know, new, new media content creators. And these are things that are being reached out to by organizations like the, the CNT and by, much more, uh, you know, left, left leaning as well as, you know, the, the, you know, the core sort of very historical workers unions groups here, they're also being reached out to by, I guess, more contemporary parties that are coming at it from perhaps an anarchistic or from a left, uh, a quite a far left, um, uh, standpoint. Um, but they're also, they're almost seeing the importance of these, you know, pockets of industry not just to say oh it's all just be industry it's these pockets of new industry that also could benefit from having um this kind of organization being injected into it, where as you said once we were born into so you know uh up until that point it we, you know it was established we didn't need that so yeah no i think it's it's a massive push forward um absolutely and thank you for adding it because you were saying like oh it's just adding to it but without evidence of what I'm talking about. I just sound mental. Um, and so I think that that is, to me, yeah, like I, like I said, in terms of answering Stephen's question, it's a sapling among the cracks. I think there, there is evidence that things are changing. Um, mm-hmm. And while... Okay, so obviously, if we can overcome the cultural situation, there might be far harder barriers to uh, transcend. Let's find out first. I think that was one of your points last time. Um, Maybe off off the video. But um, yeah, let's, um, I think, Lane... Uh, back to Lane. Back to the video. While he said that about about the social incapacity to self organize, um, to form genuine social networks of resistance, um, he brought up the Frederick Jameson uh, distinction um, mm. about the human subject that we had um, an option. The first was that if modernism, and this, this keys directly into what you were saying, um, because, because obviously we had a situation where unions were strong up until the, the assertion of neoliberalism. Um, and so if, if we take if we take that period up to that period as modernity where the human subject um, existed in a capacity as defined um, by certain strands of philosophy in, in the enlightenment, um, what happens then with this cultural intervention of neoliberalism, something postmodern um, occurs. And so if postmodernity occurs, if we're no longer modern, 
then we're no longer human. A post-humanity occurs. And in this post-humanity, one of the conditions is this, uh, this incapacity to self-organize. Uh, Jameson's point then... Oh, no, no, yeah, yes. Jameson's point is that his, his other option, uh, his alternative view is that the issue to allow ourselves to think outside that situation because of course Jameson is speaking um, before post postmodernism uh, or the possibility of such um, the alternative view is that even in modernity the human subject was a bourgeois myth fed to people um, to sort of um, to rationalize what was happening, what the what the impact, the social impacts of the capitalist economy on society, obviously social impacts, um, to rationalize that, to make sense of that, and this is this is where the simulacra of individuality starts to be extended to people, um, probably far more substantial than Facebook, a uh, hundred years or so on. But um, the idea of the self and the idea of individuality um, that people had been enjoying at the elite level um, is given as a model. It's like, well, look, you, you work hard, you get to middle management, you can uh, buy your place, buy your, buy your freedom, buy your contract, your slavery oh. contract, whatever, um, and um, have a family and just like me and buy a carriage or a car when they get invented and you know, just be an individual, which by the way, if the, just to sort of conceive of what that means, like a bourgeois individuality, and this isn't necessarily philosophical, but practical. If in China, the individual was realized in the same way it has been in America, the world would literally crack into for the amount of rare metals necessary for everyone in China to have a phone and a car the way they do in America. So this 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 is what we're talking about, like the distinction, um, the bourgeois myth. But, and this is where sort of um, where Lane makes his jump, his mid-air double pivot. Um, <laughs> he says, "What? Well, yeah, he he brings up the point. What if we're already past post-modernity, and um, are we then sort of?" What 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 then for the for the human subject, the post human subject, the post post human subject, is it the pre post human subject? Are we just humans again, or should we not be because that was a that was a bourgeois myth? Um, I always got the impression I don't know did I say it in the last one or or to you at a different time, but I always got the impression that um, Marx wasn't anti individualist and socialism. And the left isn't anti the individual; it's just anti a particular interpretation of being an individual. Because if you look, and without without going into Lacan and Mouffe's sub individual components of passions and identity, um, identities. If you look at a group of people, there's there's individual peoples, oh. <laughs> so you know. We, we can identify what an individual might look like. The distinction, though, if you look at a group of people outside a slum or a group of people heading into a mansion for a party, the way they're behaving is entirely different. And I think this is... Um, nothing to fa- found this on. It's just a, it's sort of a hunch, really. but Or maybe just a, a way I imagined to help me conceive of um, this idea where I picked up elsewhere that, like... Marx or or socialism or whatever um, whatever element of the left uh, s- didn't seek to suppress individuality but just reimagine re- individuality. So it's to it's to go back to a point in in the time of the Enlightenment where this particular interpretation became hegemonic and hmm. to um, to put in its place. Uh, an alternative based on a different way of behaving hmm. because the way rich people behave is, 
is pretty disgusting. And I don't mean that like individual rich people. Like if you just happen to be rich compared to me, you're just going to act disgustingly. But what I mean is philosophically, um, the disdain for for groups of people, for the for vulnerability in people, for the need that people have to find support in groups, to find support at all without money. Because money, give, like I said earlier, money gives a false sense of independence. Or not a false sense of independence, but, um, well, it is a false sense because, you know, you can, it's an infinite regression as to where that independence comes from. Uh, yeah, and I mean, the drive, the drive there that actually continues on that, those sensibilities or that established, um, I guess, what some might argue is a common sense to want to try and, um, I guess, uh, I mean, a really, really gross way of putting it is just make as much money as you possibly can. But I guess the, you know, some might, it that that translates into a, a, a success metric for others. And I think that, yeah, what, you know, one can find quite, quite disgusting in that is not only just that success, that concept of that success metric, but also what what is it in, I guess, that person's uh, programming that that makes them think that the drive in order to continuously um, succeed at you know at that at the accumulation of wealth over um, any you know else. any kind co- anything else anything else and most of that will be you know on the backs of um, humans. Yeah. <laughs> other human <laughs> other else? humans or or the environment and like oh, no that's... no no they were born with it or maybe yeah. it's just maybelline well, maybe it's just maybelline maybe it's gonna f- go over some people's heads so even even <laughs> god yeah really <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is that even still the slogan <laughs> i don't think i don't know <laughs> oh anyway i yeah, know um in capitalist realism mm. um mm. Mark Fisher says something. Oh yeah, yeah. So in terms of, um, it's not about, it's not about instituting the big state. Um, instead, seeking to subordinate the state to the general will. Um, so this, this idea, I think. I, I mean, I'll get to that in a second. So this idea of um, subordinating the state to the general will. So the left here has an opportunity to not articulate this, you know, a philosophy just sort of takes, or an ideology even, more succinctly, uh, takes on a life of its own, or can do, you know, because it's like um, it's like going to war, once you, once you send an army in a direction, it's very hard to get them to U-turn, and often conflict happens, even though a diplomatic resolution was, was just about settled. Mm-hmm. Oh, excuse me. So, whatever, and uh, you know, the idea that the, the left is there to suppress um, individuality through instituting a big state um, is circumstantial. Um, no, no less thanks to Stalin, um, but also, you know, even if even if Stalin didn't occur. Um, the, the c- capitalists would still be able to articulate this idea because, in the sort of, in the way through the twentieth century that um, the left saw to to assert itself, I suppose, was through um, taking over the state and suppressing sort of bourgeois democratic um, mechanisms that might, you know get it ousted straight away but ultimately it wasn't to institute the big state it was to subvert the state to the will of the people and this is just a democratization a process of democratization Mm -hmm. and um and what why i'm relating this back to what we just said there was because this is the distinction and not only the distinction between what the left is and what the left is said to be but also the distinction between what another way of individuality or how another way of individuality can be can come about or individual um, another way it can be interpreted um through relating to the state so obviously the right uh, conservative right and um and liberalism seeks to undermine the state um 
to free itself from the state to allow markets uh, to to imbue them with the capacity to act independently of the state uh, and that is one way of being an individual what the left can say here is um, just this distinction um, between different forms of individuality why am I saying that again <laughs> is to is to um, is to use the state and to um, and to use the democratic process on the state so instead of the market and not in terms of instead of the market get the state to do everything but instead of the market providing independence of the in, for the individual get um, getting state apparatus and um, public infrastructure to allow the individual emerge from because when you take because when you take material access to material um wealth away from people we become pretty pretty animalistic i'd say Hmm. you know um without sanitation without without medicine without um cooking (laughs) utensils like I'm, i'm sure i'm sure things would would get pretty brutal so the point here is that um, yeah, they, they have public public provision instead of market provision, and oh. distribute material that way. As long as the state, this isn't like the state. This isn't like Mao's blue shirts. It's um, it's a democratic situation. Subject the state to people's will. Because of course, states up until now have been have been um, have been a, again a, a bourgeois machination, like a parliamentary democracy, a, just a, a compromise. Oh God, Jesus! You want to have your say? Come along then and bloody shout, and we'll tell you to fuck off, and we'll continue regardless. You know? Yeah, so, exactly. We'll 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 get to that bit. I mean, we'll we'll get to those things you want eventually. Absolutely, eventually. Um, but first, we we do have some stuff to do. We've got Thank we've got a the- war. We've got m- multiple wars. We've got business. Yeah. We've got business to do. And how can we feed you if we don't get our business done? Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no. So so subjecting it to yeah the the you know those those kind of you know always those the same the same things that seem to come up consecutively every time you have people like list off like the bear kind of you know the things that they expect from i suppose from yeah from from you know state financing things like the right to food the right to education the right to housing um it's the same stuff that you know everyone it it comes up on everybody's list (laughs) so to speak um so subjecting the state to saying no 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 look let's let's take care of these things and and democratically uh but let's let's take care of these things first yeah uh, rather than than hoping that they're i guess handed on, or i guess given on to us by a completely unregulated free market um just by throwing a load of cash at it how having it. Sa- having said that though i'd imagine if there was ever the situation that um a left wing u turn was to take place the very same rhetoric <laughs> would have to be employed it's like Hang on, guys. We gotta go. We gotta put a lot of things into place here before we see the benefits. Just to sure. Side. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just, just in case, in case that you gotta put that caveat in. If it's ever we ever are in a, a lucky enough position for it to be thrown back in our face. Oh sure, sure. <laughs> and we're back. Refreshed. Mm-hmm. Um. Can't quite remember where we left off, which is going to be weird because I will have just, or we will have just, one of us will have just said what it was a second before this. But um, I think uh, in terms of in terms of our Lachlan Mouffe, Mark Fisher, and Doug Lane sources um, in capitalist realism. Um, Fisher does go on about the the um, the way social grievances, where the way subjectivities are formed, cut across class, 
and they are in um they do sort of manifest in individual psyches um and so this sort of mirrors what Lacalle and Mouffe are talking about um not only is there a plurality of subject positions in the public but also a plurality of subject positions in the person in the individual um either way both of them sort of denounce the uh the possibility of the universal subject and um and I th- they diverge i think where fisher says well we need we do need collective subjectivities. We do need to sort of come away from the um, the individualist tendency towards subject position formations and identity formations um, and try to, and this obviously brings us back to Stephen's question, how, how do we overcome the, the techno barriers, the cultural barriers? But if, if we for the crack if we accept um our response uh, that we've been speaking about up till now um we need to we need to conceive of collective subjectivities and Lachlan, like i said they diverge somewhat Lachlan and Mufus's answer to that is the chain of equivalence um the hegemonic project um the they they do a technical treatment of the the relationship between the plurality of subject positions that would be involved in this chain of equivalence that would amount to a hegemonic challenge to the status quo, um, where the autonomy of each position has to be um, autonomized, has to be maximized, um, but not to the point that uh, chains of difference, chains of difference, relationships of difference, differentialities basically will sort of obviously disintegrate any possibility of um collecting so obviously obviously that again that brings us back to steven's situation uh, and our current situation or seemingly current situation um how to overcome those differentials or differentialities and and you know okay so obviously the last chat my answer was make america great again um, and I think we'll pick up on sort of discussing that in two chats time a bit more, like uh, where Stephen said, well, America is still quite divided. It hasn't really brought anyone together. Excuse me. And um, But for now, uh, it did bring people together to cause an effect in terms of a political outcome. And that can happen again. Like the form that can take can be different. And we can also, again, discuss that a bit more. Um, but um, yeah, I, the answer, our answer, things are changing. It can happen. Uh, it's 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 a, a politics of frontiers once more, and mm-hmm. upon frontiers, people's passions are um, stoked, and and they'll do mad things like go out and something. Um, so where back to I think we signed off actually on Doug Lane's double pivot was it or not double pivot <laughs> double voids um, his mid-air pivot oh maybe it was a double pivot mm. regardless um, <laughs> he he out like so I was watching the video I'm sure, I don't tell me if you didn't feel the same but I like you know Jameson's um second alternative uh option that we that we were just talking about it's pretty appealing like so it 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 seems peculiar to me when at the end of the um video lane says something along the lines of is it theoretically we've surpassed capitalist realism or no, if if we can consider if the if the fact we're considering Habermas's modernity once more 
are we already sort of stepping beyond um, capitalist realism and postmodernity? And mm. as we're suggesting, is this is this sort of um, not quite a paradigm, but is this moment um, moving? Are we are we getting past it? Um, because I mean, look, you know, so so capitalist capitalist realism is talking about returning to Habermas's modernity and I suppose hege- hegemonic and social strategy hegemony and social strategy is based on Gramsci's concepts of hegemony and is sort of rooting itself in the possibility that once existed in collective um, movements mm. so like all, all the all these writers are talking about um, the potential so I think what Doug Lane is saying, well, okay, if we're talking about the potential and we're no longer sort of merely talking about the stasis and the incapacity to do so, well then, in theory, are we moving past it? And um, and to me, I think it just, maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm reading into this, but to me that denotes, um, not denotes, uh, alludes to the the the, the, cont- the contingent uh, aspect of, of of this category um yeah okay so some of us might want to go back to the uh, like like articulate a discourse based on the modern um subject and return to the human subject some of us might want to do that but re- reinterpret it as a in in a in a not in a bourgeois um vision, image. Mm-hmm. Um, some of us might want to uh, give up and just succumb to the idea that we are utterly fractured. But then also, and I think this is what I'm saying, am I reading into it or not, but um, also there's just the possibility of through the struggle, through through do you know when you go on Google Maps and you click on a spot um, and there's pictures and mm-hmm. people have just put those pictures in? So all around the world, people are like taking pictures with their phones because they love to and they load them up to Google and you've got this like, you know, like other than the Google car running around and satellite, you know, so other than that infrastructure, people are adding content to it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Sophie had that, but instead of the wonderful sunset with the pelican silhouette, um, you had the story of subjugation. That was what people were sharing. And all of a sudden you got a picture of the world in terms of its vulnerability, uh, exploitation and power. Um, You've got a glimpse of of the of the collective subject, possibly even the universal subject, in a in a in a reimagined way, mm-hmm. because we are still human, we do still sort of look like each other, <laughs> um, and we do have common unmet grievances. So that capacity still exists, and it's just about being able to to tell that story to reflect those commonalities um and amazingly the infrastructure exists and i suppose that's what i'm talking about if, if culture becomes or digital culture becomes a ghetto um then we can occupy the once directed space um with with this other thing with with idiosyncratic ways and that might be one of those ways because who can who knows but if people are agitating for that, suggesting it, encouraging it, and you don't have, if the people encouraging otherwise are now focusing on security, biometric reading, for instance, um, then, you know, that possibility, that potential exists. And you have broken out of the 
the mindset and the common sense that capitalist realism as an ideology has um has sort of really hammered home for the last few decades you've broken out of that mindset and you're no longer creating content in terms of um nostalgia Mm -hmm. this is now this is the now so obviously in in the in is postmodernism conservative and also in capitalist realism the one of the big focuses is the uh how how we're unable to focus on the now and we feel that now is inauthentic and we're always looking back to what we feel is more authentic real times and if we're if we're constantly doing that we are in well constant denial of the real the actual real so how can we engage in it and how can we change it so that's i think that's the power of um of this recognition of capitalist realism and um I suppose like back to Stephen's question it's like well yeah you can encourage it but how do you encourage it enough and then the response being well if things are changing culturally and if well it, things are changing politically is almost enough but if from that also culturally then that possibility certainly arises and we could create both an artistic and a critique general movement that um, draws this picture of power and exploitation together, and you know, from there, you're you're sort of inspiring more and more to do the same. Mm-hmm. Um, and I suppose that the the tension where that where where that brings the tension. Um, there's still a bit of tension, unresolved tension between the sort of the two positions here, the zero books position and the black lamb move, and that's um, in terms of the radical break. So I mm. think I think um, I think people, I think Doug Lane and Mark Fisher would advocate for a a radical break. And the need for a radical break with the current society, whereas, um, and we'll get into this further next chat probably. Whereas Lachlan Mouffe are advocating for um, a, a staying within liberal democracy, but a reinterpretation of what liberty and equality means. Yeah, like a repositive, like a a positive charging of of these things. Taking, I guess, yeah, we we shouldn't abandon the better or more admirable um not admirable um i guess yeah what they they kind of classify as like the better elements of liberal democracy um whereas but rather but rather than just leave them to say oh no they're doing fine the way they are it's rather the continuous practicing of those in order to expose any I suppose weaknesses or any kind of contradictions that we have within the current um, integration of these ideals like equality um, and yeah, well, equality and, and, and liberty Um, and then try and attempt to push past those, but while maintaining a positive charge of these elements rather than abandoning them altogether. Whereas, yeah, I guess, like, as you're saying, Lane and, and Mark are sort of saying, you know, it's failed. We should, <laughs> we, we need a radical, radical shift from these things towards something else. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I mean, I assume sort of like the baseline for socialism is to have that radical break. Mm-hmm. Um, and luckily, we're attempting to say, oh, no, 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 it's not necessary, guys. Let's, um, Let's just hijack the ins- the infrastructure that exists through hegemonic uh, processes. Now, in terms of all the frontiers um, we've been talking about later on in the series, um, that's that's absolutely um, that's I would absolutely agree. Um, we've got it. We've got to sort of use every material avenue, every existing avenue um, at our disposal. 
and uh, to to push a he- a, that hegemonic um, the war of of position um, on each of those fronts. Um, that is not to say, though, that if a radical break was to um, the opportunity to have a radical break um, should or should not be well should not be taken not to say that it should not be taken um, and so obviously Lacan Mouffe would disagree and it is just about having a democratic version of neoliberalism in government but also once once that's achieved to take every sort of relationship where where power is a factor and democratize it um which isn't to neutralize power but to sort of articulate a position um where that power is visible and where the value of that power is negotiated Uh um but my issue and I wonder, is later Muff, um, is she feeling the same? But my issue reading the earlier stuff is that I wondered with this Frederick Jameson notion of the bourgeois individual, that could we ever get to the point where, particularly with our current cultural situation and interp- and and manifestation uh, of the individual could we escape that without a radical break is there a way say like if you take any subsection of society um where those possessing of an alternative view of democracy were ac- would be in a position to actually articulate that uh-huh. um it's almost as if lacklan Mouf are forgetting their own like one of their founding principles uh that power has to be recognized so it just seems it just seems like like if you if you take um like a young urbanite and um how how does the how does the conversation go the practicalities of the conversation with, say, someone from the rural working class, which is obviously what happened in the left in the UK in the last few months. Both, you know, kind of on the left. Yeah, actually, no, they were, of course, it was the Red Wall that fell, isn't it? So they were on the left up the north working class. and um, But they felt that the the liberal urbanite youth aspect of the left was stealing a march and um and they failed to identify with the with the overall project so without a radical break how do we sort of overcome that if you know what i mean is that is that clear does that make sense yeah no i think it makes sense any any takes? Any takes? Um, I mean, I, I guess, I guess that's a, it's a, that's a tough question. So it's not so much answering that question, but um, I mean, I suppose we're not here to say yes or no. I mean, like, do you, I don't even think that I'd have a definitive personal stance. That's just like my worry is how, how do we get past that conversation or that form of conversation? Um, how does the, if, if the, say, just an essential term, essentialized term rather than it's, ne- it's required complexity, without its required complexity, how does a, um, a, a what has been con- like continuously disempowered over decades rural working class individual identity how does that get to the point where it can confidently assert its vision for individuality when in the same 
party, the same political field, the left. Um, and another subsection of that party has such a confident sense of self and a, a, like, a, a, like a publicly legitimate sense of self. Of course, the, the hegemonic articulation is to undermine that assertive aspect, but how does that first, how does that kick off if, if that lack of confidence is there? And that's, that's a power relation then. So in terms of radical break, um, I, th- I think that might be the that might be the, the reason why, uh, in relation to Lack Lamb Move's position on it. The other stuff, the other branch of the conversation is. Um, is a treatment of the universal. Mm-hmm. I think I think uh, this is the final block of the conversation, um, and we've alluded to it already. Uh, speaking about where I said um, it, it's not. It, it's not nece- it's not quite semantic it's not quite a semantic difference but there like there is a sort of a common substance when um when one side of this tension is saying there can't be a universal subject and the other side is saying well there can be um paraphrasing on both sides there um so like the the significance i found initially in lane's vague void that he presents this this big openness this new frontier is that um oh well you know if we did successfully create like a socialist google you know if we did manage to create an an art and critique an aesthetic um movement that reflected the truth of now to the point to 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 the um what's that called like what was that what was that uh, critical mass <laughs> um and yeah and achieved a critical mass of of that reflection um or that reflection achieved a critical mass um you've got a glimpse then of of a universal situation of subjugations or acts of subjugation happening across the board that can all be identified um to 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 be rooted in in the inability for people to democratically um negotiate those relationships which is i wouldn't call it capitalism i would argue that the conservative element of society, what it seeks to conserve is a um, is a historic social arrangement from post feudal times, um, because obviously they instituted a new social arrangement deposing mm-hmm. the aristocracy. Um, and hey, Ed here. So at this point in the recording, I irrevocably dropped the ball and totally failed to recover the point. Having looked back over it, I think this is what I was trying to say. I was saying that the tension between Lachlan Moves' conception of the universal subject and Doug Lane's perhaps isn't warranted, as both appear to be using the term in a different way. (laughs) While Lachlan Moves warned against the universal subject as a totalizing revolutionary class subject of the more traditional Marxist left, What Lane appears to be talking about is a universal and historic relationship of subjugation. If a left movement was somehow to reflect this universal experience of subjugation through an art and critique movement focused on the now, rather than then, more people could come to identify the situation and our general, or universal, inability to democratically negotiate the nature of those relationships. 
I was saying that I wouldn't posit this strictly at the hands of a capitalist system. After conceding to Lane's possibility of a universal subject, here I'm introducing Laclau moves wider lens with regards to relations of subjugation. What the conservative element in our society are trying to conserve is a historic social arrangement constructed after they deposed the aristocracy and delivered capitalism from feudalism. And while this new social arrangement was prepared ideologically, seized power through and institutionalized by capitalism, this is ultimately a means to an end. Capitalism isn't the subject of conservation. The new social arrangement with the winners of capitalism in power is the subject of conservation. So I wouldn't call it capitalism, but if we were able to somehow generally reflect the wide variety of relations of subjugation where power stems democratic involvement, whether through economics, brute force, or other methods of suppression, then we might glimpse this universal condition we now live in and provide something people generally might come to identify with. The universal subject here, as a general condition of human society, instead of being a revolutionary subject strictly defined a priori, becomes an empty signifier, the thing which diverse communities and subject positions may come to identify with. It is not to construct a static, stable, global community but something that can be identified with globally that allows both for a clear target for the movement, this historic social arrangement, as well as the localised autonomy of each constitutive community or member of that movement. Look what God did! <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so the final block <laughs> of the conversation... Um, is to do with determining what the universal might mean in the universal subject. Um, so obviously, Lachlan Mouffe, there can't be a universal subject because if you expand the field of the community, uh, the further you expand the field of the community, the more increase the likelihood of um, subject positions arising within that. So uh, community in their, in their conception of it is, is like a finite resource. Like, so if it's like dough or chewing gum and you can like blob it into a, into a space and time, no, no, just space into a space. And, um, it sits nicely, but if you attempt to stretch it, it starts fracturing and, mm -hmm. and splitting. Um, and I think, uh, I think that's, yeah, so that's kind of what they're saying. The, um, yeah, I suppose you can't, I suppose ultimately another way of putting it is you, you can't predetermine a, or post-determine a, a community. You can't identify, you can't look outwards and go, well, that's the community we need. Because communities, and I suppose like Stephen was saying, already exist. Although Stephen was saying this against these guys. But um, to use Stephen's point against him, uh, no, um, communities already exist. So uh, so if you attempt to steamroller them with, with, with inclusion in a movement, uh, they'll just kick, kick up. And, and that's why... Um, the hegemonic project is is necessary mm -hmm. um but on the other hand when we putting aside what i was talking about in terms of how the how the um what way to put it how like postmodernism might be sort of coming to an end something else is there um on the other hand, and this, like I said earlier, isn't, it, it might only be a semantic difference or not a substantial difference at least, but the, what, what is universal, what universal can mean, what a universal subject can mean, can be sort of, can be seen as being different. I think, um, If we had the, if we had this this Google of socialism, and we had a look at 
what everyone was this this critique the the art movement and we, we catch a glimpse of an actually existing human subjectivity as diverse as it is it doesn't have to be a community and i suppose that that's an important distinction maybe maybe a class was always formulated the universal class the universal subject was formulated in terms of a community if you envision the universal subject as not so much community but using lacklown moves um terminology a cha- the, the potential chain of equivalences um you sort of why not have a a, a universal subject i suppose maybe i suppose the term subject there is what becomes problematic um because subject connotes a, a homogenizing commonality and unfortunately i think it was um uh, just out on zero books that the video was it yesterday i think on um united or popular fronts uh, that discussion uh, that quite possibly might come in and qualify some of what we're talking about here mm-hmm. but i think um Zizek's take on universal the possibility of a universal subject is interesting again because because uh, he, he he's treating it more directly than say the video um lane's video um because he's talking about um while you can't have he, he agrees with lackley and move you can't have a total society you can't conceive of society in a total way you can't conceive therefore of universal in a total way but speaking about it when we speak about it in the abstract not when we do in the abstract but when we do speak about it it is in the abstract um you're talking about people included people excluded so in neoliberalism and capitalist realism papers over the cracks um it's not a universal consensus uh though it desperately attempts to be and portray itself portrays itself as um suppressing dissent Mm. Um, that is a universal according to Zizek because it is a totality everything is already there existing sure. so the subject's truth if I'm getting this correctly sort of qualifies what the universal is so instead of subjective truth if the subject's truth is the determining factor in identifying what that universal is then it's a possibility so i'm trying to think of a well he 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 says something along the lines of uh well you you, you take you take the 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 subject that the subjugated subject the subject <laughs> you take their perspective so Zizek uh, uses the um the example of Jews and German Nazi in, in Nazi Germany. Um it's not a it's not a postmodern situation where we consider both stories. The potential of a of a ground up grand narrative exists. The subject not subjective truth of considering all stories, but the subject's truth of having such horrific power brutally enacted upon them that's all we need to consider and um this he says can save the universal um <clears throat> but i don't know i mean so is is Zizek in that instance then is he getting is he making the statement that uh in that regard i mean i guess in this regard we're we're talking about the i guess it the 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 two sort of extreme poles of 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 nazi 
Germany that he's talking about here is one the having uh, a, a party having like such a dramatic amount of power and the second is for a group of people to have such a dramatic amount of power enacted or acted over them or onto them um is he saying in that regard to like to extract a a universal subject like one would only as you said have to go as far as to say um you know this group that were because of this particular moment i guess or because of the scenario of what's going on here the universal subject in this regard is that that is having this 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 horrendous amount of power enacted over them is that to say that i don't know the conception i guess that people are putting forward of how we would conceive of of how yeah of how we conceive of a universal subject is we're overthinking or or how how is he getting there because it it i'm just not really sure how he's extracting like how you get from we need to conceive of or it's or it's plausible or possible to conceive of a universalist subject within the context of the point about nazi germany it seems like he's saying well all we need to do is that like say well, we can extract it from this it's a it's a partial it's a partial vision right but it constitutes uh-huh. a universal vision. Um, in order to, this is him, in order to know what Nazi Germany was at its most essential, you shouldn't balance all discourses. You should identify with the excluded object. I think th- this idea that when it's, when um, the universal is, um, hegemonized by the lowest factor, the excluded mm-hmm. ones, it sort of, it qualifies the universal in a, le- in a legitimate way from the perspective mm-hmm. of the left. Okay. Um, because where neoliberalism the neoliberal elite is constructing a universal um, that that excludes people um, by definition, but attempts to conceal that exclusion, while a real big R real universal exists, and but it can't be mediated. We can't understand it or comprehend it mm-hmm. when when it's articulated so the so the inverse of what the neoliberal elite are doing uh constructing a universal consensus uh which by definition excludes people and then enact the cultural interventions that papers over this exclusion uh reinforcing the impression of consensus when the abject, when the excluded, speak out about it. They are talking about a universal situation because they're included in the universal real, but they're talking about this universal in a different way, that they're experiencing the the power of the act of mediating the universal. So I suppose... It's it kind of, it's just a different way of saying what Lacklea and Mouffe are talking about um, in communism or in, in like, so Soviet Russia. Um, there was a, a universal working class Soviet community was extended upon the population and... Um, particularly through the Cold War, I guess, um, it, it, otherness was suppressed and concealed. Uh, the excluded from that community, uh, things that didn't fit with the aesthetic ideal, um, was brushed under the carpet. Mm-hmm. However, the real action 
the real sort of practice of that universality existed. All the units were there. There wasn't beyond beyond the party's um, propaganda. There wasn't a, there wasn't actually an excluded at all. There was a real sort of they're not excluded. They're just power is being enacted upon them. So when you have oh, okay. when you have their account of that, you're getting you're getting you're getting like this extra shade. Like if I if I shone a torch on my on my background, all of a sudden the negative space comes into view and you've got a you've got a bigger picture. Um mm. and I think um yeah, so Zizek's saying, well, that changes things. Um you, you've got it you've got you've got the the black and the white of the universal. Um but this is this is this is what Lackley and Mouffe are saying because they're saying, well, listen, you can't have the working class as the um, the the privileged um, identity um, right. or subject right. position uh, because you suppress that what's happening in the negative space. Mm-hmm. So that I mean, I, th- I I guess when they're talking about the impossibility of the universal subject of talking about this sort of superficial construction. So when other people are talking about it in the political, when other people are talking about it for political reasons, but not necessarily, maybe not necessarily in a political sense, you're getting, um, they're talking about the universe, like, like they're appealing to the real, but recognizing that while it can't be comprehended as such, that it will always be false. As Zizek says, well, identifying with the lowest excluded member of that is sort of is sort of good enough. Okay. All right. And I think that would apply to or like that would continue succinctly into the next chat when we're talking about Moof's populism. Mm-hmm. I think we'll start with um we'll start with a treatment of her agonism, um, but focus on on her on her populism because in 1985 with hegemony and social strategy, they're not talking about a populist movement. Um, they're talking about a a, a radical democratic hegemonic struggle within liberal democracy. Um, yeah. But by the time 2018 or 17 comes around, uh, Moof has got a bit of a, a bit of a different tune to play. Mm. Um, so yeah, let's pick it up then and there and everywhere. Awesome. Awesome.